Hey guys, so we're going to go ahead and continue with our notes for standard 11 and 12. Uh, over the weekend, you should have already uh, submitted your vocab for standard 11 and 12. For my people that are uh, virtual, um, what I wanted you to do was if you were able to print the vocab out, put it into your new interactive notebook, complete it, take a picture, and submit back to me. If you were unable to print it, uh, doing your doing it online uh, would have worked as well. Just need to make sure that you get those um, those done and completed standard 11 through 12 vocabulary. Uh, I've posted that vocabulary on the Google stream on the home page, so it, you should have had access to it. Uh, so if you haven't done that, please make sure you get that done uh, ASAP because it will be going in the grade book soon. Um, today, we're going to continue in our interactive notebook on page five, we're actually gonna be on the bottom of page five. Uh, I, I, For my virtual people, I attached uh, the document for that, that you would need to print out. Uh, it's, it's a half page. <clears throat> and for my people that are in person, uh, I'm not going to be there today for first and second period. So uh, this video is also for you guys as well. You're gonna be listening to this in class. Uh, but that half sheet of paper I gave to you guys the other day in class, uh, you should have that glued into the bottom of page five already. Uh, so we're going to start there today on the bottom of page five, talking about westward expansion and its impact on Native Americans. Uh, so you will need a highlighter uh, and something to write with. So we're on the bottom of page five. Uh, and last week, we kind of led, uh, led off looking at what the Gilded Age was, what it meant, uh, why did we have a Gilded Age, which was this period of economic boom. Uh, and it was a bunch of different things, technological innovations like the telegraph, like the Transcontinental Railroad. And then we kind of transitioned into what does, you know, who built the Transcontinental Railroad uh, and um, where was it being built? And so we, we talked about the Chinese immigrants that were in California that helped build the Transcontinental Railroad from west to east, but also uh, the Irish and German and former slaves that were helping to build the Transcontinental uh, railroad west uh, and and what that looked like in terms of you know going over the various geographical aspects of the United States and so what I want to look, look at now is you know with the transcontinental railroad you have more people moving out west you have more settlements popping up uh, and naturally of course the Native Americans are going to be the ones that are on on the outside looking in uh, and they're going to be the ones that are being once again moved from a place where they were already moved once before. Uh, and so you're going to see this this mass migration of Americans West and Native Americans are going to be the ones that are typically suffering at the hands of that Westward expansion. So again, we're on the bottom of page five uh, with that half sheet of paper. If you haven't done so already, get a highlighter and something to write with. So this is what the bottom of your page should look like. Uh, so looking at our Westward expansion impact on Natives, uh, we're going to look at some factors and then look at the direct results of these factors, and then what was the impact on natives. So uh, the factor here we're looking at is railroads, uh, so several factors. So we have railroads, uh, better farming technology like barbed wire. Uh, barbed wire is going to be used by ranchers, cattle ranchers and farmers to keep their cattle in a sp specific area so they can't wander off and get lost. Uh, and so that's something that really wasn't used in the East but is more uh, necessary out west, especially uh, with the Homestead Act of 1862, with these homesteaders that are getting 160 acres of land, uh, they can't afford to let their cattle roam over 160 acres of land. So it's important that uh, these ranchers use barbed wire to help keep their cattle in one specific location. Uh, plows are also going to be very pro uh, prominent out west, uh, especially in terms of getting really deep into the soil, soil uh, and trying to get any water or nutrients that they can to help their crops grow because we know that out west it doesn't rain a whole lot and so farmers are having to use the water that was is actually within the soil uh, to, to help their crops grow. Uh, and then also another factor, a third factor is increased settler population and this is a, a direct result of the railroads uh, once the Transcontinental Railroad is built, people are more willing uh, and encouraged to move out west and stay permanently rather than just visiting. So you're going to see an increased settler popula population 
with, uh, with the railroad. So looking at some direct results, uh, a direct result of the railroad is once again you have an increase in people moving west due to easier transportation for goods or trade. Uh, you know, a trip that would typically take from Georgia to California six months now takes six weeks with the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, you know, markets are growing. Those businesses in New York can now do businesses with uh, with people out west in California. So that is, you know, you have people moving from east to west to expand their business practices and attempt to make more money. Uh, and, and railroads are are are, um, are are the main are the main cause of that. Uh, without railroads, this wouldn't be wouldn't be possible. And if it was, uh, it, the progress probably wouldn't have been as fast as it was. Uh, with the better farming technology, uh, you see better opportunities to successfully farm. Uh, plows are going to allow for improved farming on new soil. Again, try and dig deep into the to that dirt into the soil uh, and get whatever nutrients, whatever water that might be available to help those crops grow. Bobbed wire will help will help make ranching easier. Like I said. Uh, these ranchers, cattle ranchers, need to be able to keep better track of their cattle and not have to worry about them roaming over 160 acres of land. Uh, so the barbed wire really helped them kind of keep their their cattle in um, in one area. And then increased settler population. There's always a need for more land. And this is a story that we've seen, you know, from the 1700s, you know, back in the first semester when we talked about. Uh, uh, Americans initially moving west past the Appalachian Mountains, there's always this need for more land. And, and as a result of that, typically that land that's needed is land that's occupied by Native Americans. Uh, and so, you know, with that being said, uh, Americans during this time felt like the land was there, not Native, was theirs and not Native Americans. So naturally, Native Americans had to, you know, had to go and they had to be moved to make room for these new settlers. Uh, so the railroads obviously impact on natives and in, in that more people are moving west. So need more land for settlers to live on, to, to farm on, to survive on. Uh, and Native Americans are going to get pushed to the side once again. Uh, the barbed wire is going to create problems for nomadic or wandering tribes. A lot of the Native American tribes, especially in the Great Plains, were nomadic tribes. And that they followed the buffalo herd. They followed their food wherever it went. Well, this barbed wire uh, is, is going to get in the way of them moving and following the buffer, buffalo herds um, because the fenced off areas are really going to limit the movement of those tribes to where they cannot you know, follow the herd as they normally would. Uh, and then with an increased settler population, you're going to see tensions rising over land claims, uh, conflict between natives and settlers. Native Americans, uh, uh, you know, essentially, especially in the West, are not going to go nearly as easily as uh, Native American populations in the East. Not saying that the ones in the East went uh, easily, but the, the Native American population, the Lakotas, uh, you know, the Nav Navajos, those those Native Americans are not going to go quite as easily as as their counterparts in the East. Uh, so because of increasing tensions, uh, the United States will get involved by creating what we call the Fort Laramie Treaty. Uh, with the tribes in the Plains region. So what this Fort Laramie Treaty did uh, stated that in exchange for receiving land set aside for them, the Plains Nation agreed not to harass or threaten Western settlers. So this Fort Laramie Treaty uh, was, was really a big deal. And this is what's going to set the basis for what we call Native American reservations. Uh, so basically what the Fort Laramie Treaty told the Native Americans and gave the Native Americans, it says, hey, this is the federal government telling Native Americans, we're going to give you a, a specific area of land. Uh, and as long as, you know, you stay on that land, you don't bother the settlers or threaten the Western settlers, we won't mess with you. And so basically, again, Fort Laramie Treaty establishes reservations for Native Americans with the federal government telling these Native Americans, we won't encroach upon this land that we're giving you if you don't bother Western set Western settlers. And it's just kind of ironic in terms of, you know, it's the federal government saying we're giving you this land when it was never the federal government's to big be to begin with. It was the native Americans land. Uh, but it's just, that's this whole idea that uh, this land in the United States and North America is the United States. It's Americans uh, and it's not native Americans. And so uh, that Fort Laramie treaty is going to, again, establish the, the, the reservations uh, and it's the federal government's attempt to tell Native Americans, we won't mess with this land anymore. Uh, it, this is your land. We'll, we'll let you have it. Just don't mess with Western settlers. 
but the, the treaty will ultimately not be effectors effective. Uh, the settlers, Western settlers are going to essentially ignore uh, the reservations and ignore those, those limits and those, those regions and move in and search for gold. And so once again, it's white settlers that are, um, are encroaching upon native American land after the federal government's told native, the native Americans and the plains Indians that they wouldn't be bothered after the Fort Laramie treaty. Uh, and as a result of that war will break out between natives and the settlers. And those where we're going to get major battles like the battle of little bighorn, uh, the, the massacre at wounded knee as well. So what I want you to do now, uh, especially, uh, for my people that are in one a and two a, that are that are listening to this in class uh your sub has these notes uh at my desk so once you get to this uh, i need you to go get these notes at the top of it says impact of western of expansion west on native americans uh what i need you guys to do is go get go get a sheet uh, i need you to get your scissors uh you're going to cut this sheet uh, in half vertically uh there's and you're going to glue this to the left side of page number six so uh, the page you have it's a full page that you're going to get and it's going to have this uh, times two so what you'll do is you'll cut it vertically right down the middle uh, you'll take one half the person sitting beside you will take the other half and you will glue it onto the left side of your page your notebook on page six uh, and what you'll do is you're going to read these excerpts uh, and we'll go i'll read them through to you, but you'll read the excerpts and then answer some questions. But pause this video uh, and, and go get the paper, cut it out, glue it onto the page, uh, onto the left side of page six. Uh, for my people that are virtual, uh, this is has been attached to you. This document has been attached to this post on Google Stream for you to have. If you can, please print it out and do the same thing that I told that told my kids that are in person uh, and and follow the instructions that way. <laughs> It's one of the most crushing defeats in American history. Custer's last stand. June 25th, 1876. Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer and over 600 troopers of the 7th United States Cavalry arrive in the Little Bighorn Valley of Southern Montana. The cavalry has come to subdue a village of defiant Indians. Thousands of Sioux and Cheyenne, under the leadership of the great holy man, sitting there. For a century, the United States has pushed the frontier west, herding tribe after tribe onto agencies or reservations. The Sioux and the Cheyenne don't want to give up their land on the northern plains. These last defiant Indians gather into a colossal wandering village. In the spring of 1876, the village arrives on the plains of Montana. The village was always on the move. They knew the army was out after them. And to the United States Army, to capture a fleeing village was an impossible task. Custer follows Sitting Bull's path west across the Wolf Mountains. On the other side, the Indian village stands on the banks of a slender river. The Indians call it the Greasy Grass. The army calls it the Little Bighorn. On the morning of June 25th, Custer and his troops arrive in a treacherous landscape carved up into hidden channels and ravines. Perfect cover for fighters who know its contours. Deadly for the soldiers who don't. Around noon, Custer makes what many believe is his fatal mistake. He divides his forces into three separate columns. Custer heads up the bluffs along the river to attack from the north. It's his first clear look at the size of the village. He realizes he doesn't have enough troops to do the job. He sends a rider south with a note calling for more men and more ammo. It's important to keep in mind that no one had any idea of how many Indians there would be. They simply had no idea. Indians are surrounding Colonel George Armstrong Custer and his battalion. Survivors are struggling to join up with other troopers on nearby high ground. A spot now called Last Stand Hill. The tables are turning for Custer. He's no longer the attacker, he's being attacked. Decides to take this high hill, which we call Last Stand Hill today. 
all the soldiers killed their horses to hide behind. A lot of the warriors said was they got close to this hill, they arched their arrows high into the sky, having those arrows come down behind those dead horses. They said, we rained arrows down on those men. Their shots quit coming, and we rushed up and we killed them all. Lieutenant Colonel George Custer and over 200 of his men annihilated in a defeat that devastated America in 1876. This battle, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, was the Plains Indians' greatest victory. This caused the government to send out more forces, more military. Less than a year after the battle, Sitting Bull flees to Canada and Crazy Horse surrenders in Nebraska. The last stand has been studied more closely than almost any military engagement in our history. Today, the battlefield still lies serene and empty above the cottonwood trees lining the Little Bighorn River. USS Enterprise. Okay, so uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn is something that we've all been learning about and hearing about since we were little when we were in school, uh, elementary school. Uh, so what we're going to do today uh, is we're going to look at some d different documents related to the Battle of Little, Bo little Bighorn, looking at a textbook version of the battle, a letter to the president from the Secretary of War a month after the battle took place, and then recollections of a Native American woman about the battle uh, from 19, the year 1922. So she's reflecting back on the Battle of Little Bighorn. So our job is to analyze these sources and draw evidence from them in order to answer the question, uh, who was responsible for the Battle of Little Bighorn? So you saw on the video um, that the Battle of Little Bighorn was really one of the greatest victories for the Plains Indians during this, you know, this standoff between the Plains Indians and the federal government. Uh, and, and all that victory did at the Battle of Little Bighorn was to convince the federal government that they needed more troops out there, out west, to subdue and to basically put down the, the Plains Indians, which they successfully did. Uh, when you when you heard uh, Sitting Bull, you know, fleeing to Canada and Crazy Horse. Uh, surrendering in, in Nebraska. So, uh, and then we, we're going to look at the, the massacre at Wounded Knee and what that is as well. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to read through these three textbook, these three versions of, uh, or three versions of the Battle of Little Bighorn. Uh, and on page six, you'll notice that you have the the excerpts on your page on your page, and then right below those are a series of questions that I want you to answer off the side on the lined part of your notebook paper so uh again we're going to look at these i'll read i'll read through them um and then you guys will out you, you guys will pause the video and take take the time to answer so this is a textbook passage about the battle of little bighorn it says for years the lakota sioux conducted raids against white settlers who had moved into sioux lands in response the u.s government ordered all lakota sioux to return to the reservation by january 31st 1876 they refused the situation was turned over to the military, and about 2,000 Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho gathered near the Little Bighorn River. The leader of the Sioux, Sitting Bull, conducted a ceremonial sun dance. He reportedly had a vision of a great victory over the soldiers. The brash leader of the U.S. Army troops, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, predicted victory as well. On June 25, 1876, Custer led his troops into a headlong attack against superior numbers. Custer's and his troops were quickly encircled and slaughtered. The Battle of Little Bighorn was a tremendous victory for the Sioux, but only a temporary one. Now the U.S. government was even more determined to put down the Indian threat to settlers. Okay, so looking at that excerpt, here's a picture of General George Armstrong Custer, and here's his battalion of men that are going to be massacred at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Uh, here's a picture of Sitting Bull, uh, and this is, you know, the Native Americans sitting around this tent, tent uh presumably do, uh, of, about to or in the process of doing a ceremonial dance before they go into battle. Uh, so here's, I, I've put the, um, put the excerpt back up here for you. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause this video and in your notebooks, I want you to answer, the, answer these four questions in response to this excerpt. So again, you're going you're gonna to answer these questions off the side on the lined part of your notebook paper. So you put number one, answer the question two, three, four. So make sure you number your responses so that when I go through and check, I know what I'm looking at. So first question is, it says, according to the textbook, what caused conflict between Lakota Sioux and the U.S. government? Uh, question number two says, who, according to this textbook passage, who started the, the Battle of Little Bighorn? 
Number three, uh, why does the textbook say Custer lost? And then number four, what does the textbook say about do you think this account is an accurate description of Battle, Battle of Little Bighorn? Why or why not? So this last question is an opinion opinion one. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the textbook passage. But the first three, you're going to answer them based off what the textbook passage has said. So pause this video. If you have to read back through it, that's fine. But answer these four questions right here. Okay, so let's look at our second source. So this is a uh, a letter from the Secretary of War, J.D. Cameron, uh, called the Cameron Report. So it says, to the President, Washington, July 8th, 1876. So this is a, a couple months after the Battle of Little Bighorn. There have been a certain wild and hostile bands of Sioux Indians in Dakota and Montana. I refer to Sitting Bull's Band and other bands of the Sioux Nation. These Indians continue to rove at pleasure, attacking scattered settlements, stealing horses and cattle, and murdering peaceful settlers and travelers. The present military operations are not against the Sioux Nation at all, but against certain hostile parts of it that defy the government. No part of these operations are on or near the Sioux Reservation. The accidental discovery on the western border of the Sioux Reservation and the settlement of our people there have not caused this war. The young Indian warriors love war and frequently leave the reservation to go on the hunt or war path. The object of these military operations was in the interest of the peaceful people of the Sioux Nation, and not one of these peaceful Indians have been bothered by the military authorities. Very respectfully, J.D. Cameron, Secretary of War. So we notice in this letter, if you read back through it, uh, J.D. Cameron's placing all of the blame on sitting uh, Little Bighorn on the Sioux Nation. Uh, he calls them murderous. He says they love war. The young Indians love war. Uh, they're attacking scattered settlements, stealing horses. They rove at pleasure. Uh, you know, yes, we found gold on the edge of the settlement, uh, but it was accidental. We didn't mean to find it there. But he's almost like he's justifying them settling there because they found uh, they found gold, and even then, it didn't cause the war. So uh, this this piece is pretty biased. This piece is pretty biased. And so uh, what I want you to do is I want you to just like we did with the first document, put I've put this back up here for you. But I want you to answer these five questions. So number one, I want you to tell me who, uh, who wrote the report, what was his purpose, and when was it written. So tell me who wrote it, why was he writing it, and so when was he reading it. So you're going to get all the information up here from this. So number two, according to this document, what was the cause of the conflict between Indians of the Sioux Nation and the U.S. government? Again, the answers can be found in this paragraph up here. So please make sure you use specific evidence to answer that question. Uh, number three, why would Cameron write the accidental discovery of gold on the western border of the Sioux Reservation and the settlement of our people there have not caused the war? So think, why would he write that? Uh, he is Secretary of War. He's an American. Why would he write this? Uh, it's almost like he was trying to put the blame. He was putting the blame on the on the Sioux Nation and not on American settlers. So he was trying to make it seem like American settlers were innocent. Number four, how does Cameron describe the Sioux Indians who he believes are attacking the white settlements? Again, use the specific descriptions up here in the paragraph to answer this question. And then lastly, what are the similarities and differences between this report and the textbook? So there are some differences uh, in terms of, you know, this report's pretty biased towards the American settlers and the other of the textbook kind of just gave the facts. So how is this? What are the similarities and what are the differences between the two okay uh and our last one this is from kate bighead uh she was a, a a child at the battle of little bighorn and she is reflecting it back in 1922 she in 1922 she's reflecting back to the battle of little bighorn so the source is kate bighead a cheyenne indian uh, who is going to tell this story to Dr. Thomas Marquis in 1922. Dr. Marquis was a doctor and historian of the Battle of Little Bighorn in the 1920s. He will interview and had photographed Cheyenne Indians. And so this is what she has to say about the Battle of Little Bighorn. Little Bighorn was not the first meeting between the Cheyennes and Longhair, or General Custer was what he was called. Uh, early in the winter of 1868, Longhair and the 7th Cavalry attacked our camp on the Washita River, killing Chief Black Kettle and his band, burning their teepees and destroying all their food and belongings. In the spring, Longhair promised peace and moved the Cheyenne to a reservation. When gold was discovered, white people came and the Indians were moved again. My brothers and I left for the open plains where our band of Cheyenne was, attacked, was again attacked by white soldiers in the winter of 1875. We were forced to seek help from, the tribe, from a tribe of Sioux. We joined Sitting Bull and the Sioux and decided to travel and hunt together as one strong group. As conditions on the reservations became worse, more and more Indians moved west, joining our group. 
Six tribes lived peacefully for several months, hunting buffalo, curing the meat for the winter months, and tanning buffalo hides. In the early summer of 1876, we set up camp near Little Bighorn River. Soldiers were spotted by some hunters to the south of the camp, and we know what happens next. So uh, she has a little bit different account of what happened, at least in the events leading up to the Battle of Little Bighorn. So just like you did in the previous document, I want you to tell me what type of document this is. Uh, primary, secondary, primary source is a source that is coming directly from someone who was involved in that event. So Kate Bighead was who experienced Little Bighorn was directly involved and directly experienced the Battle of Little Bighorn. Uh, so she would be, uh, she would be a primary source because it, because it's coming uh, directly from her. A secondary source, on the other hand, is someone that is writing about an event that happened, but did not directly experience it. So because Kate Bighead was there and she experienced the Battle of Little Bighorn, this would make her a primary source, not a secondary source. Now, if this account was written by Dr. Marquis and he hadn't interviewed Kate Bighead, uh, and Dr. Marquis was just writing about what happened to Little Bighorn, that would have been a secondary source. So be able to tell the difference. Uh, and then with number one, tell me why it was written. Uh, number two, according to Kate Bighead, what caused the conflict between the U.S. government and Native American tribes? Uh, again, it's going to be her account of what happened uh, or, or what caused the conflict is going to be much different uh, than uh, than everybody else. But it generally is because of gold. Number three, what are the two difference between, differences between Big Head's account and the Cameron report, report? There are two major differences, so make sure you write those down. And then lastly, which of the two documents, the Cameron report or the Kate Big Head interview, do you think is most trustworthy and why? So based off those two documents, what you read, tell me which one you think is much trustworthy, at least in your mind. OK, so pause this video. Make sure you have those answers, uh, those questions answered on in your notebook off the side. Please make sure that you number them because I am going to check them uh, when we come back to class on Wednesday. Okay, so despite the Native American victory at Little Bighorn, the Plains Indians were essentially doomed. The U.S. government targeted Buffalo, which wiped out the Native Americans' main food supply. Some Native Americans moved to Canada, while others were forced to live on reservations. Uh, so you should be able to, we should have uh, on the bottom of your notes on page six, you're going to be highlighting uh, these notes. Uh, so the Battle of Little Bighorn will strengthen the United States' campaign to relocate Native Americans to reservations. So yes, Little Bighorn, uh, the victory at Little Bighorn was uh, was successful for the, you know, was a huge success for Native Americans, especially the Plains Indians, but ultimately they were going to be overmatched. Uh, the U.S. government, you know, while fighting Native Americans, are also going to target their food supply in the Buffalo. Uh, and once that's gone, Native Americans, you know, are going to struggle to survive and continue to make it. So they're forced to flee to Canada to start over or live on the reservations. Uh, and the Battle of Little Bighorn, again, just really angered the American government and the American forces. Uh, and so it's going to strengthen this whole campaign of eventually moving Native Americans all on to reservations. And so if you relocate Native Americans and give them their own land, then no more conflict. At least that's the thought process behind uh, the, the, the federal government of the United States. So make sure you have this stuff highlighted in your notes uh, and that you have this written off to the side as well. Okay, uh, so the Lakota tribe, so some more things we're going to highlight. The Lakota tribe, or Sitting Bulls tribe, uh, was performing the traditional ghost dance in defiance of the U.S. government. Uh, we're talking about, did this skip something? So this event right here is going to be the Battle of Wounded Knee, or the Wounded Knee Massacre. I'm sorry. So you have the Battle of Little Bighorn, which was a huge success for the Plains Indians, a huge victory for the Plains Indians. But then you have the exact opposite with the Battle of Wounded Knee or the massacre at Wounded Knee. Uh, and so this this event uh, is really going to bring the end to any Native American resistance in the Great Plains. Uh, and what happens is that you have the Lakota tribe, which was Sitting Bull's tribe, where he will eventually flee to Canada. But they will be performing their traditional ghost dance in defiance of the U.S. government. At this point, uh, the Lakota tribe, the U.S. government is trying to move the Lakota tribe into a reservation uh, and they are pre performing this ghost dance in defiance of that uh, to show their their defiance and their rebelliousness. 
uh, gunfire will erupt, you know, in, in all actuality, really a, an accidental gunfire, uh, a gun accidentally went off. Uh, and in response, the federal government, uh, the federal forces there that are escorting the Lakota tribe to, um, to their reservation freaked out and opened fire on over 300 uh, Sioux, Na- Sioux Indians uh, standing there waiting to go to the reservation. Um, 300 Sioux men, women, and children will be left dead. Uh, which is probably one of the one of the biggest ma- single event massacres of a Native American tribe in, in U.S. history. Uh, this would again be the last major conflict between the Native Americans and the U.S. Army, as it signaled the end of resistance to Western expansion. After that point, Native Americans will largely go to their reservations just to avoid being killed uh, and avoid any more conflict. So the significance, and I want you to write this off to the side once you highlight this stuff. The significance of the Wounded Knee Massacre is that it was the end of Native American resistance to U.S. settler expansion west. Really, they were just, you know, at this point tired of, of losing their lives. And so they kind of just um, became resigned to the fact that, you know, they just needed to give in if they wanted to persevere and, and you know, preserve life. So that we'll, they, they went to the reservations um, and it really was the end of any big uh big resistance at, at least uh so here's the 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 scene of the wounded knee massacre this is where it was that took place again a gun accidentally goes off spooks uh spooks the the federal forces there they open fire and kill over 300 uh sioux native sioux indians uh, including men women and children and here's a picture of them performing the ghost dance as well uh, so for the longest time, this the Massacre of Wounded Knee was actually called the Battle of Wounded Knee. Uh, but you, a battle implies that both sides had an equal and fair advantage. Uh, this was not the case at Wounded Knee. Uh, these 300 Sioux men, women, and children were, were, were massacred. They didn't stand a chance. They were unarmed. They were innocent. They didn't have any weapons. They couldn't defend themselves, and they were gunned down in cold blood. So that's a massacre. That's not a Battle of Wounded Knee. Uh, because the, the the Sioux Indians never had a chance to fight back. Uh, this is going to be uh, a traditional jacket worn uh, by Sitting Bull, uh, at, at, but that who will eventually flee to Canada. And this is a picture of them performing the ghost dance. I believe on the next slide, I have a vid- video of that ghost dance uh, that they performed at uh, at Wounded Knee. Came to me. When the sun went into shadow and I lay dying. And in my death, I saw the heavens of the white robes. Yes, it is as they describe it. But also there, my children, all the Indians that ever roamed this earth. All your beloved ancestors and mine, and those young ones who were taken by the white man's diseases, do not grieve for them. They want you to know that they are happy Yes, and you should not grieve for yourselves because here is what the white robes did not tell you. The white man, my children, will soon be no more. <laughs> now you must not hate the white man. This will only delay his end. But if you will 
do the dance that I will teach you. All the ancestors will return and the buffalo will be renewed and you shall all live forever forever in the freedom that we as Indian people once knew. Sun. All right, so that is it for notes today. Uh, please make sure you get that page six complete. The questions on page six need to be answered in your notebook. I'm going to check them on Wednesday. Uh, so once you finish that, uh, if you did not turn in your vocabulary this past weekend, uh, please make sure you work on that and get it turned in because uh, I'm going to grade that. And once I grade it, or once I start to grade it, uh, I'm going to start putting missings in for those that haven't turned it in. So if you haven't turned it in yet, uh, please do that and get it turned in ASAP. So uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to me on Google Classroom, Remind, or email me as well. Uh, and I will see you guys on Wednesday.